Hey, yo, check this out. This is Wayne Wonder, representing for Warwick Hill TV. You see the vision, don't it? See the vision, Warwick Hill TV. Keep it locked. These are the issues that we need to address. We need to address. You understand what I said? You understand what I said? You understand what I said? You see? Set the path for the youth, then. For the youth, then. Share, like, and subscribe, and stay tuned to the channel. Because you don't know all this shit. All this shit. All this shit. All this shit. Greetings in the mighty name of His Imperial Majesty, as I would say. Yay. Big up to all the subscribers and the viewers in the house. Yeah, watch a man. <laughs> Infectious Tapazuki. Yes, I. <laughs> when I and I first introduction to music, you see it, and I and I give thanks to no say. The I still there. You see it. Hold it up, general. You see it. And I get okay, and I am um, on. Um version of the history of the individual but you can also go to court him 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 him, him interview on youtube tapazuki and cut you know see how you find say you read between the lines smartly <laughs> you see say <laughs> you see say i want to man them that you see but i know you get a reason from any perspective still from the general, one of them there, you know, see it, but no respect to Bazooki Rasta, you know, see it, out of sight, out of mind, you know, you know, see it, and it's more than really to back some tune star, and I go through the whole thing, but, they go fix it up, my general, but it come like me, we just feel like, say, whenever I and I are introduced to a program from now on, I'm on for say it like, you know, see it, greetings in the mighty name of his imperial majesty, as I would say, yeah, you know, see, mm, just out of respect for the eye. <laughs> I love my foundation, you know, when I'm there, you know, you know, see. Anyway, we'll continue with the reading. We'll continue with the reading from the book. Um, Born for Dead. You know, see, it. so I know I'll touch upon another chapter. See? So we're going, you know. We're going, you know, it's like I and I. <laughs> yeah. Farewell, Kingston. You know, see, that chapter there, there, you know, what was the one where I said next chapter named New York? <laughs> New York hat. But yeah, feel well, Kingston. You know, see it. So, we'll continue with the reading from the book. I don't know. It It, it established some, some point in time the way. And I recently I get some, some, some gap, some T's and that cross and things like that. You know, see it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The Green Bay Massacre and the short lived gang truce, it's parked were soon forgotten in the nightmare of the 1980 election. There were 889 murders that year, over 500 more than were reported in the previous year, and most of them stemmed from political warfare. In April, 30 men just in combat camouflage assaulted a JLP dance on Gold Street, the boundary line between Southside and Tel Aviv, killing four people and wounding 11. Jamaica's experiment in democratic socialism was coming to an end in what Michael Manley called a hail of bullets and a river of blood. The 1980 campaign also brought the first murder of political candidate. The PMP's Roy McGann and his bodyguard were killed in Garden Town, a village in the Blue Mountain foothills above Kingston. In a late night gun battle with a JLP mob, Police, listen, this is the full stop them in another book, I must tell you. The full stop them and the camera them look the same. 
it's a paperback, cheaply printed. Uh, I never observed the quality, uh, you know, before. But again, it still makes good reading, you know, just spare me the, the ABCs, you know, see. JLP, uh, police were, were there supposedly to protect the candidate. But the last words that my grand bodyguard shouted were, the police are firing on us. Another ghastly riot erupted in Spanish Town where Manly and DK Duncan were scheduled to address a PNP rally. But we had the whole land, what go on, what go on yes, a while ago. That matter here. Yeah. What go on yes, the man, the P Ryan McGann bodyguard. The 1980 campaign also brought the first murder of a political candidate. The PNP's Ryan McGann and his bodyguard were killed in Garden Town, a village in the Blue Mountain foothills above Kingston, in a late night gun battle with a JLP mob. Police were there, supposedly to protect the candidate, but the last word that McCann's bodyguard shouted were, the police are firing on us. Oh, them bit of history that just disappeared. So that a, that's a political assassination. And it just sweep under the carpet by both spectrum by the political thing. <clears throat> Another ghastly riot erupted in Spanish Town where Manly and DK Duncan was scheduled to address a PNP rally. On his way to the town square, Manly was stopped by a detachment of police who warned him that soldiers had already fired into the crowd. Although the melee made it hard to tell exactly where the shots were coming from, Manly took the police at their word and was horrified to think the army was now shooting at its own people. But he and Duncan refused to back down, and they drove onto the square. Debating what to do next, the discussion suddenly became irrelevant. Manly recall in his book, Struggle in the Periphery. A new burst of gunfire started. It was coming from every direction. Some witnesses claimed that Duncan drew his own gun and started shooting back. Another first for a political candidate. Yeah, it was on TV. I saw it. It was a chrome 30, 30 um, Magnum or 38 revolver. And uh, the light from the, the camera system at the time was streaming due to its chrome. You could see the glisten streaming along the TV screen. And that's where the argument came from. Get flat. Because that was, he grabbed Michael Manley and said, hear it loud on camera. I don't know guess how to spell it. So, hear it loud on camera. Get flat, Mr. Manley. Get flat. And I'm Mr. Manley in call him. I remember the name of him calling him. And, and them formality there. Get flat. And the man up on them back of them stairs so out them big magnum and, and I protect Michael Manley. Yeah, me, me, it was on national TV. I remember that it was a pivotal point in new media history. You understand me? Because gunshot was busting on them and he stood up and tried to get Michael Manley down and things like that. Yeah, something that I saw. Late one afternoon on a scorching spring day, just before I left Jamaica in 1986, Brambles took me to a farm near Spanish Town to meet the man who had procured the JLP's guns for that shooting. His nickname was Billy the Kid. Already, Billy worked as a caretaker on the farm which was owned by, you see this is that come across more shocking to me, you know, given the state of affairs today, I know everybody uh, brush off the man and I go on like them nice and all of them type of thing there, as if poor people forget certain things, because certain things is being hidden. But you see, if I never feel the vine yards, them and the big man, them and the elder, them way, I'm on a reason it most recently too. You know, all of them things you know, still be like, more than wonder if the woman will write the book, just uh, over sensationalized the... The history, you know, because certain things really sound exaggerated based on the facts that I, and I never have mature enough knowledge for taking them levels there at the time. You see what I mean? I say, but yeah, go on with it, Rasta. 
Billy worked as a jail as a caretaker on the farm which was owned by a JLP councillor for the area and we found him in the fields at dusk. Like any seasoned veterans of the poli political wars, Billy was taciturn and evasive. He hedged around his role in the 1980 shooting until Brambles made out made one of his inspired moves. He knew that Billy loved Western movies with a passion, so he mentioned that I'd come to Jamaica from Wyoming, the legendary territory of many a Wild West bandit. Billy's face lit up, and he considered me with fresh interest. Billy warmed me then, sensing a kindred spirit. <laughs> he began to talk with an outlawed, engaging modesty about his godfather role in the JLP and the party's parliamentary organization, organization in Spanish town. Billy was the JLP gunner and bang, bang man, the one who delivered the weapons and paid the mercenaries. But I was slow to grasp the fine point of his arrangement. I wanted to know where the money came from. <laughs> well, Billy said, we have a JLP caretaker for the area. A man named Williams, and he is a druggist. You mean he owns a pharmacy? I asked. Billy and Brambles laughed. No, sis, Billy said. I mean the ganja business. Williams got the money from Williams got the money for the guns from his weed. You want to talk to the, the men who shot up the rally? Then make we go and find them. We drove to a shanty town called Homestead not far from the middle class neighborhood where Billy lived. Soon we were turning left, turning right and left and right and left again. Through a maze, I would have, I would, would have been unable to find my way out of alone. Without, Billy, without Billy's constant direction, I might as well have been blindfolded. This was nothing like the grid of streets I had grown up to know in downtown Kingston. Homestead was a tangle of shanty lanes and narrow pathways, many of them much small, much too small for a car. They were walled off by zincs and scrap board fences, behind which the yard stretched for what seems like miles. A full moon was rising as night fell, bathing the place in a ghostly light. Although the settlement was quiet, Except for the friendly sounds from rum shops and yard, I could imagine the terror that would have transformed it in a, in a night gun battle. We finally pulled up in front of a tiny rum shop with the requisite complement of young and old sufferers, longing in the shadows and basking in the evening coolness. Come out, Billy said. You two were waiting. You two wait here until I come back. Brambles got himself and me, two Heinekens, the correct labor right beer for a JLP neighborhood, and wanted for and, and waited for a long time until we saw Billy coming back. We saw Billy coming down the lane with five young men, sounding with the, un, the unhurried gait that proclaimed is we rule here. This is the Ayatollah, Billy said, introducing the passes unmistakable leader he was drop dead handsome. His, chis his chiseled features framed by a name, by a mane of dreads. And he was dressed in camouflage pants and a fishnet t shirt. A few gold chains glistened in the moonlight on his chest. The other men were silent, waiting for their leaders to make his move. And the rum shop crowd parted for them like a scene out of a western Billy saw at Meyer. The Ayatollah suggested that his crew and I drive to his yard a few chain away to reason. I threw a questioning glance at Brambles, who only nodded, and we left him and Billy at the shop. Now we were moving to see so deep into the homestead maze that my claustrophobia went from panic to fatalism until it came to rest at trust. <laughs> his home was a small, poor concrete house with a living room crawled crowned, full of plush red velvet settees. The men sat down with their, with their beers and spliffs and waited politely for me to say something. 
Well, I faltered. I want to ask you about the 1980 time. Billy told me that some of you played a part in what happened at the rally. You is a journalist, or what? The Ayatollah asked. Everyone leaned forward when I said that I was working on a book about gangs and political violence. This was their story, and they wanted it to be told. The Ayatollah smiled, but sadly, then I will tell you how it went, he said. Months before the election, PNP activists started coming out here, all the way from Concrete Jungle. And let I tell you, there were one wicked set of men. They brought down doors and shoot up yards, demonstrating the power of the PNP. They killed my baby mother. They were looking for her brother, through so they knew he was a laborite nut. They found him, and after they killed him, they shot her too. She was eight months pregnant at the time. The other men nod in agreement. One of them, a youth who was probably a child during the campaign fury, spoke up. You remember the manly time, miss? You recall the shortage we had? How there was no salt fish, no flour, no rice, no cooking oil in the shops. Jamaica never stayed so until manly messed everything up. I refrain from saying anything about how the merchants and shopkeepers were to blame, hoarding precious foodstuffs to raise the price when the dollar plum plunged. Many of them were paid off by the JLP. Oh, I saw, I said that before. I, that it was written somewhere. It was actually written somewhere. Yo. <laughs> and there was Cubans all around the place. Another man said they was building the Ozemate school near Spanish town. And Manly said, we was all to be grateful for their being here. He sucked his teeth. Why Jamaica need Cubans to build things here? They, they all the while go on like them better than we. The Ayatollah, the Ayatollah spoke again. But it was the violence they turned us, that turned us against the PNP. For true, things just got so bad towards 1980 time. The jungle lights had guns and we had nothing to defend ourselves with. So what about Williams, I asked. Yes, him, answered the Ayatollah. Him have the ganja trade well in hand, so him just left off little money and guns for we here in Homestead and some of the other areas like Winter Pen, Garden Pen, Duncan Spen, and Spanish Town Central. What kind of guns? Mostly M1s, the Ayatollah said. Them is old, yes, but effective, and we, and we each got paid $200 for shooting up the rally. By that time, we were spoiling for revenge. We rose from the velvet city and drove back to the rum shop. The huge moon was high by then and the night's pleasures was in full swing. The jukebox was cranked up and I couldn't hear the Ayatollah's voice when he whispered in my ear, what? I said, leaning towards him. I just asked the daughter if she liked to have a little coke. It was the first time anyone in Jamaica had ever offered me cocaine. Rambles was quiet for a while after we said goodbye to Billy. Did, she, did you took the coke? Did you? Uh, well, maybe. maybe I, <laughs> it would have been. I would like to know. It's the first time in Jamaica that me was offered to you outside of Jamaica elsewhere. So, um, well, it's uh, yeah, all right. Brambles was quiet for a while after we said goodbye to Billy and the Ayatollah. I was concentrating hard on the road, clouded by exhaust, thick as fog. He knew that I was leaving the island for good that summer, and neither of us had begun to deal with separating. He read my, he, he read my mind and broke the silence. So what, would, so what we going to do to mark your leaving, taking? to mark your leave-taking. He talked about taking a road trip to the country, across the island to Niger. He had a friend named Kenty, an ex corporal from the Jamaica Defense Force, who brought Sensimania from a ganja girl named Niger and smuggled it out from the Kingston wharves. Kenty had suggested that the three of us go to check his man in Westmoreland and then asked me to carry a hundred pounds of skunk-smelling Sensimania back to Kingston in my trunk but I had been in too many roadblocks to oblige. 
halted by uniform cops and their sinister looking friends in street street clothes with their index finger poised so lightly on the triggers of their M16 that the sound of a passing car's backfire would have been all they needed. If you're interested in this cocaine business, Bramber said, the way is ties into politics and thing. You could do a little research in nigger. I have a friend there who juggles coke and he could tell you some stories about the white wife. That was a phrase of the moment, a perfect description of the, foreign, of the drug's foreign origin and its power to lay waste. Cocaine was a novelty, a fairly recent addition to the island's pharmacopoeia, but it was quickly becoming the next bad dream, as it always does. Tourists had brought it to Niguel in the late 70s, where it was soon to be rigor for our whites and their rent a dread consorts. But across the island in Kingston, cocaine made a different kind of entrance. The drug started showing up on the, in the pockets and noses of JLP gunmen just before the 1980 election. That was a coincidence. No one cared to probe. But it was said by Carl Stone, the Yui professor and political scientist, that the drug was partly responsible for the sickening nature of the violence during that time. Atrocities such as the killing of children and the mutilation of pregnant women, Stone called 1980 the reign of the wild eyed gunman. Whether or not Siaga was, feeling, was feeding cocaine to his paladins, the JLP definitely controlled the trade. Jamaica became a major Caribbean transshipment point for the drug when Sierra came to power and several of his government ministries were said to be involved in protecting its movement into and out of Jamaica. The police, most of them badly paid and poorly trained country boys who were easily corrupted, were they come like everything bad at Jamaica, they blame it for country. <laughs> <laughs> were cut in on the trade. By the time I moved to Kingston in 1984, cocaine was everywhere. The Chinese controlled the uptown market and JLP had it to themselves in the ghettos, which was, which was why it was easy to come by in labor right enclaves like Southside. By 1984, crack was already replacing polo cocaine in the ghettos. Since Jamaicans were were given to smoke in ganja, it was natural for them to take to the smokable and cheaper form of cocaine. It wasn't that prominent like everybody who smoked ganja love or it wasn't even so. Most of the people who smoke crack, crack, crack cocaine don't even like ganja or never even like ganja. It's two different vibes. You understand what I say? And um, I'm sure it wouldn't have. You know, it, it wasn't the kind of one kill the other. You know, see, yeah. You know, see, he did that argument that Larry Gunn said, Yeah, I learned that, that but no man gave it up. That's what I think we don't remember. You know, say nothing. <clears throat> but Islanders were slow to. But it, it's a country gunman. Remind me of this. You see, yeah, you have a story about a man. Right? Have a monkey. And the monkey smart. So I'm left with the monkey for babysit the pig, you know. And when him go to work, everything where him do, the monkey do it back to the pig, you know. If him pick me them misbehave, the monkey and him beat the pig, them. I make you say discipline the pig, you know. Monkey discipline the pig, you know. Too. Him cook, feed the pig, you know. Force all the baby, them on a life. Food and cook food too much for eat. Monkey force feed the pit in them all day. The man I know if you get rid of the monkey. So one day I'm just shave him through, shave him neck with a sharp razor. I use the spin on the razor quickly. I use the back of the razor, you know. I just box it by them throat. Bah, 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 bah. Put him back the razor and go and work. When he come back from work, monkey lie down in a bathroom, bleed out, neck, throat bust. You know. For a fashion monkey. But islanders were slow to awaken to the drug's menace. 
for foreign political consultants and aid agencies had crammed it down their throats that ganja was their country's major peril and the americans didn't seem to worry too worried about ganja about jamaica's cocaine problem it was ganja they were forever spraying with lethal herbicides and burning with flamethrowers but the americans would soon have reason to worry about jamaica and cocaine Chacha. No cocaine no come from Jamaica. I was chacha. Jamaica was a It's this was rumor anyway. Probably she just had to pick up that. You know, probably based on the nature of things back then, it could have been considered as a factor. Jamaica could have been considered as a factor because of its geography it was a transshipment point according to them. You know, it wasn't produced there. In 1984. The Drug Enforcement Administration sounded a quiet warning in its annual intelligence report. Increasing evidence of cocaine traffic in Jamaica is of concern, both because of the threat to the local population and because it involves foreign criminal elements. Some Jamaican traffickers are believed to have switched to cocaine because of the relative ease with which it can be shipped in comparison to marijuana and because of the large profits to be made. What the report neglected to say was that Jamaica's entry into the Caribbean transshipment trade dov dovetailed neatly and brutally with the island's American funded ganja eradication program. As the ganja barons found it harder to get their products off the island, they began to piggyback their shipment on the cocaine trade, and it wasn't long before the local market became a lucrative sideline. The friend Brambles wanted me to meet in Nigri was one of the local ganja dealers who had made the shift from the weed of wisdom to the white wife. Cocaine hit the local population in a force that was not unlike the way alcohol devastated Native Americans in the 19th century. As one of Brambles' foster lanes friends said, the first time I take it, it make I feel that dazzled like. Soon he was hooked on the dazzle, selling every stick of the furniture his mother had left him and pimped his baby mother for his hide. We left our nigger with Kenty riding shotgun on a, on a cool early morning and took the junction road, the steepest and most beautiful route over the Blue Mountains. The road was no wider than a car truck in many places empty as a bush path except for country people on foot or riding donkeys soothed by the bucolic loveliness of the landscape brambles lost his usual edginess and became serene we stopped so many times along the way buying roasted corn and pepper cups of scarling soup straight from vendors kettle but it took us the better part of the day to reach Nigri. Kenty wanted to check his grower on the outskirts of town, so we dropped him off at a red dirt footpath into the hill and then went to find Bramble's friend. His name was Lyrics. In Patwa, someone who flies Lyrics is a general con artist of the first rank. Of the first rank. I don't know how we going to find him Bramble said I mean what kind of mood he's going to be in sometimes he licks the pipe for days and days and then he's in no shape to reason lyrics are also high up in the district called red ground perched on a hilltop with sweeping views of the sea we parked the car and walked panting up a steep rock thrown path with hummingbirds darting through the bush and goats trailing their ropes as they browsed Lyrics was sitting in a porch swing that hung from a huge mango tree, drowsing in the shade. He greeted Brambles as if he had known his old friend was coming. You go on, you go on live long, Lyrics said. Lyrics said, the Jamaican way of saying that you are going to live long. For sure. That you'll have good luck for showing up just as someone is thinking about you. Lyrics was smoking herb and he was in a mellow mood but as we began talking he waxed eloquent about his ups and downs with cocaine he liked talking about the drug and he had the addict's classic fascination for his substance 
dreads of its consequence, coupled with no will to quit just yet, he was bitter, but he was still enthralled to the white wife. There was time not so long ago, he said, when we were when when we here in this island never touched cocaine. What did we know about coke? We don't grow it. But it seems like ever since this Siaga business start of the GLP here in Westmoreland come down hard on the ganja man like punishment. This area being PNP ever since now man man the time. Old time people here still remember the sugar strike of 38. You know that when Siaga start burning the ganja fields, some of the key workers set fire to the fields in revenge. Lyrics laugh. Coming like they were saying, no ganja, no cane. Coming like they were saying, no ganja, no cane. I don't know. Sometimes I think the JP set this whole thing up. Seems like the 70s belong to Manly and to ganja, but the 80s now, they belong to cocaine. I see dreads I know from town walking down the road with woods from their own yard to sell out just for coke. It's a free base thing. Once you start, you can't stop so easy again. And if you have plenty ganja, you can trade it for powder. Right now in Nigel, a hundred pound of good sense media will get you a quarter ounce of coke. I did some fast arithmetic in Jamaican dollars. Prime sense media was selling locally then for a four hundred dollar pound. So a hundred pound was worth forty thousand dollar. Cocaine went from one hundred dollar a gram itself an interesting fact since the magical $100 gram price held in both Nigel and New York, even though in Jamaican dollars, that same $100 was one-fifth of the U.S. price. That alone told me how arbitrarily the price of cocaine was fixed. The Colombians had such a glut that they would sell it for whatever the local market would be, and Nigel's cocaine, like the drug everywhere, was whacked every time it changed hands adulterated with anything from ground up aspirin to food powder in a quick competi competition i figured that a quarter pound of cocaine seven gram was worth seven hundred dollars this meant that local users was trading forty thousand dollars worth of ganja for seven hundred dollars worth of cocaine lyrics i said lyrics i said that doesn't make any sense you think this supposed to make sense? He shot back. Does it make sense to burn a man's field, to mash up his livelihood, to bring in cocaine at the same time as you destroy our ganja? I'm just telling you what we trade our ganja for in a decent time since you ask. Bambas and I were in sub somber moods when we left Lyric's yard. So we drove into Negril to roam through its pleasure palaces. We had a drink of Rick at Rick's Cafe and watched the local girls hustling the tourists. The prostitutes were working in droves, and so were the, the sad-eyed women who begged the white girls to let them do the to let them do the bread, the bead-tipped Bo Derek hairstyle. On the winding cliff road outside the bar, renter dreads zoomed by on their bikes with white women clinging behind. The arrangement meant that some of the renter, the rented rasters might take a little money home to their baby mothers unless they smoked it first. We walked through town and stopped in at Hedonism too, the all-inclusive resort that used to be a club med. Brambles looked miserable and tried to disappear in the lobby. So I stayed long, I stayed just long enough to pick up a brochure that said the pleasure comes in many forms at hedonism too. We have everything a body could ask for. You can scratch it, build it, tan it, relax it, strip it, wet it, feed it, cool it, fix it, and yes, even abuse it if you choose. Heights of debauchery in the midst of paradise. We walked barefoot along the Seven Mile Beach, wrapped in darkness and not saying much. A few hustlers passed by us, 
hissing in treaties. Did we want some coke? As I sat on the beach alone the next morning while Brambles went off with Kenty to do business, a rasta strolled up to me and issued what he must have thought was an invitation I couldn't refuse. Daughter, you have a nice fat. You have a nice fat fluff to say, he said. He said in a whisper that was meant to cut Joel, but only sounded full of menace. When I gaped back at him, struck dumb, he got the message and walked away. Brambles just laughed when I told him and Kenty about the encounter. Yes, it's fair game, he said. The trip to Nigerian made me sad, as Jamaica's North Coast art always does. Jamaica has its own funky vibes, but its people keep their dignity. The tourist trip, on the other hand, always make me think of what Claude Levi Strauss meant by Tristis Tropics. It is Jamaica at its most forlorn. My final weeks in Kingston were suffused by sadness too. It rained relentlessly while I packed up two years of life and boxes belonging to be mailed home. As I unframed pictures, giant cockroaches skittered from their nests behind the glass cleaning out a, behind the glass, cleaning out a closet. I came upon a spider so enormous that I left the house for the rest of the day. I slogged across a southern campus lawn for farewell drinks and suppers with friends, envying the casual stoicism with which Jamaicans say goodbye. The centuries of necessary migration had made them adept at farewells, and my own impending departure was less painful because we all knew that I would return. But somehow I knew there were faces I would never see again. One of them would be Never Hard, the history professor who had taken me up Blue Mountain for the first time. As we sat on this jasmine-scented veranda one night, sipping rum liquor, I tried to memorize his beautiful voice, something no photograph could ever convey. A few months after I left, Never died in a car accident on the Mona Road near the university gate. It, it, it was dusk, and the bus driver who hit Never's car was driving without headlights, thinking to save his battery. Is it really? Okay. It had quit. That means alternator maybe wasn't charging the battery. I had quickened my words, my work pace in those final works, weeks. I had quickened my work pace in those final weeks and did some last interviews. One was, one was with Keith Gardner, the killer cop known as Trinity. I had not expected him to see me, but when I reached him on the phone at the halfway tree poli police station, he seemed to like the sound of my voice. How do you spell your last name? He asked, evidently writing it down in his appointment book. The spelling is curious to Jamaican accustomed to English surnames. It's guns, sir, I answered. Guns with a T. He laughed and said, he would meet me the following morning. I parked my car in the lot at halfway tree and walked past the lockup where prisoners put their eyes to the tiny window and begged in a chorus for our food. It's I wanna food them off beg. I fluff. I fluff them I beg if them see the rest of Don't say that man. Trinity did not keep me waiting. He ushered me promptly into his office, where he had pictures of himself with Nelson Mandela, Jesse Jackson, and Queen Elizabeth. I asked him how he had gotten his nickname, and he explained that the original Trinity was the hero of a spaghetti western. The name came from my alleged dexterity with a gun. It started in 1973 or 74, while I was stationed at Olympics Garden. My style was different. I like to achieve and maintain the element of surprise. So those were the days when I used to carry up to 10, 11 prisoners at one time by myself. 
I used to walk them on foot. I had a reputation that then, and I commanded a lot of respect. He spoke of the impact that Western and gangster movies had on Jamaica's cult of badmanism. But he said that when he was a boy, his mother, a fundamentalist Christian, refused to let him go to movies. They were rarely things. He remembered growing up in Chenstone and listening to Bob Marley harmonized with the original whalers at dances. Brambles had told me that Trinity had a brother who, who became a notorious outlaw and that Trinity shed no tear when he was gunned down by police. They said he spat on his brother's body as it lay in the street. Trinity was a child of the ghetto who got out and his career led him to kill the, the grown men he'd once played with when they were all children in Trenchtown. I asked him what it was like to be in a gunfight. Is it a phenomenon? He said. Is it a phenomenon? He said, looking down at his hands folded gracefully on his desk. There's a feeling of high that you get. Your adrenaline is running and your heart is beating fast because you don't know what is going to happen in a split second. Between the moment when the guy reach for his waist and all hell breaks loose, you don't want to shoot him before you know because you haven't seen the gun yet but you don't want to wait either because just a split second will decide whether you are going to die he reckoned that he had been in some 97 shootout too many to still be counting i think the moment you start counting you are becoming the jerry he said i thought about the affinity between cops and criminals but like each other they finally became and remember the suffrage, the suffrage story about Trinity showing up at dance hall, just all in black with a brace of pistols on his hips like a gunfighter. A news photograph hung on the wall behind him, taken during the 1980s election when he was Seattle's bodyguard. He was crouching under fire from an invisible sniper in a West Kingston street. I asked him what he thought of Claudia Massa and the other rankings he'd rubbed shoulders with. Trinity leaned forward with an eager glint in his eyes, but then he checked himself. There are many things I would like to talk about, he said graciously, but you will understand that I cannot, perhaps at another time. Yes, I answered, baffled by how unexpectedly likable this man was. I hope we meet again. The following day, I said goodbye to another beloved friend, a journalist from Trinidad. He had covered the Caribbean for 40 years and had known the founding fathers of every island movement for independence. The man who were historical figures to me were memories to him. I always told him about the work I was doing, and although he admired it, he also thought I took foolish chances. He never even went to political rallies in Jamaica anymore, unless he could find a spot way at the back of the crowd and get out fast if he had to. He was bitter about what had become of a Jamaica he had once loved. This is nothing but a tiny this is nothing but a tiny island ruled by two thugs, he said as we parted. Why do you care so much about? Why do you care so much what becomes of it? My goodbyes downtown were higher than the ones with university colleagues. I had a sense of closure as far as teaching was concerned, but I was beginning to realize that the Posse saga was unfinished. Kingston was only a prologue, an orientation for the journey that lay ahead. Everything changed up now. Bramble said one night as we walked through the neighborhood. If you want to follow this posse business in New this posse business, is New York or Miami you have to penetrate. And up there, sir, you is on your own. One June evening, two weeks before I left, we were sitting on the bench over the gully on South Camp Road, talking with an older man named Joseph Manning. His nephew, Delroy Edwards had gone north to Brooklyn and was running a crack posse there. Joseph had raised Delroy from a child and was resigned to what the youth had become 
now that his exploits were being sung all over Southside. Joseph himself was something of a dad in the air, but his money came from a welding business he built up over many years. He was still a sufferer at heart. Every day when work was over, he'd get barefoot, put on a pair of track shorts, and drive back down to South in his silver Volvo. When his friends saw it parked by the gully bench, it was a signal that Joe was around and available for her favors. He was the one who could be counted on to drive a woman in hard labor up to Jubilee line, line, line. up to Jubilee Hospital or to bear someone out from the Central Police Station. Brambles and I settled on the bench and with, and with Joseph. Brambles and I settled on the bench with Joseph and his little group of friends watching the action of a shop across the street. Everyone called it Brooklyn Corner. It had a bandulu illegal telephone hookup for unbuilt overseas cars. And at night, and at night there was always a line of people waiting for their turn at the phone. You see that place, Joseph said. The phone rings all the time with the cars from one youth or another in Miami. In New York, wherever, and all of them seem like they gone down into pussyism and the drugs business. Joe wanted to check out the midnight show at the Palace Theatre, so we walked over there and looked at the posters which advertised Rambo. Rambo sucked his teeth in the region, and the old movie poster here used to say, Drama, he staged whisper. He staged whisper, suspense. It was mostly those two words there. Everybody would have wind up on the edge of them seat and wonder who killed who and all them type of question. And we come out of the cinema, go home and talk about the plot all night long. You know where that woman end up wrong with that book, your man? Eh? She use fear vocabulary to spell patois. How she think it should have spelled. That is a big waste of time. That. You should have just write in a year, English man. You know nothing about Patwa Rasa. You go over the world and prophets like say you come in here two years, come learn Patwa. Stupidity you write in the book, man. Waste time. Every day I do like a match when I come from here, Patwa. And me born and grew up on Patwa. Eat that thing, that man. A show like Ramba don't hold in a my time. Nobody would have want to go see him back then. When I was a youth coming up, we used to like see some heavy western. Not a whole heap of shooting, but a story, a serious detective story. We wanted dialogue like Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Weren't no Full full actors in them days neither. We had Anthony Quinn, Bert Lancaster, James Mason. Those guys would those guys would, could talk. Rambo can't even talk. He's too stupid. No, it's all words. One syllable and that kind of thing. And who's this other guy? This one they call Swatsening. Rambles made another rude sound. A few days later, he reminded he remind me of one last person I should talk with, an older man named Custom, whom he'd mentioned many times. Custom lived in Tivoli and had, be, and had been close to Claude Masso, whom he called a human rights man and had, loved as, and had loved as a brother. So he came to Bramble's yard one night and the three of us walked through to the seawall of Victoria Pier. I was tired that night. My head was cramped full of images. The Ayatollah's face in the moonlight that night at Homestead, eager for his cocaine. The sad-faced hooker at Rick's Cafe in Nigeria. Trinity thought, wait, now, for now America, you come from where them thing that, you know? Trinity talking I read, lo laconically about his 97 shoot shootouts. I was hoping that customs would tell me something noble 
from Massop's career. Maybe he had been there the day called him, confronted Seada in Tavali and accused him of being nothing but a warlord. But all he talked about was murder after murder in loving details. How many men Massop had killed to get his ranking as a Dan. The one that broke me was a story about his shooting some youth off his bicycle. I flew into a rage, vibrating between anger and tears. My voice seemed to come from somewhere else, ringing down the empty waterfront. I was shoot, shouting about not wanting to hear any more stories of sufferers who got big by killing one another. Didn't these men see that this was nothing to be proud of? Brambles and Custom sat like statues. Custom finished his beer, got up slowly, and sauntered off into the west back to Tivoli. God, back to Tivoli. Brambles was too angry to say anything. Make we go back a yard, he muttered. We walked through the street without saying a word, but when we reached his yard, he took my tape recorder and turned it on. Orientating statement, he said. Speaking into the microphone, this was to be a lesson in what I had obviously failed to learn. Despite his year of careful teachment, his pupil had let him down. Instead of speaking in Patois, he used his painstaking English he learned as a schoolboy. As a schoolboy back in the colonial days when his teachers made him recite Shakespeare and read the dictionary. Brambles loved words for their power, and that might he and that night he wanted me to feel it. To enter into the study of this ghetto society requires a certain kind of courage, he began. It is an enormously virigating and complex subject. Those willing to take on the task must have an active, energetic mind capable of putting together seemingly infinite numbers of observation and event into something approachable, approaching and meaningful whole. To think and work in such a manner requires intellectual openness, agility, or the person must face the distinct, the distinct prospect of being overwhelmed by the breadth of depths of social and political phenomena. I must emphasize colorly courage and mental agility. All previous preconceptions and bias must be eliminated. I have seen the incipient of intellectual arrogance in you, and sometimes you question the credibility of events. You are entering a new experience. You are writing something unique. You are white. It is difficult for a white person to simulate a black experience. And it is even more difficult to express or interpret something you have never experienced before. Be calm. The people in the ghetto are not the masters of their own destiny. People can use them because they don't have any money or security. They are not surrounded by the enmities they require. They are anxious. It is for those reasons why they are so susceptible to all these kinds of exploitation. You take things for granted. For to a certain extent, you are very pampered. But these people who you talk to are professors in their own rights. And regardless of their education, you could not survive one week in this ghetto without prostituting yourself. These people don't get any protection. They are strong. They are resilient. They are only the victim of circumstance. They are the professors of poverty and the pawn and the game of power politics. There was nothing left to say. He turned off the tape recorder and went into the room where Natalie and Ricky were sleeping. I heard him rummaging through his picture stash. When he came back out into the, onto the veranda, he made a black and white patchwork quilt of photograph. His favorite gift for me to keep. I had seen some of them before like the one of Claude Massop and Bucky Marshall at the start of 1978 troops, standing in the midst of a smiling crowd of sufferers with their arms around each other. I had seen the one of Dennis Barr, the gunman called Copper, 
who was killed by alleged police in the purge that followed the truth. We'll soon tell you now I've gone. Brambles had gone on assignment to photograph Copper in jail and he captured him wearing a blackberry looking out at the camera in near profile his chin in one hand and a pensive weary look in his eyes but there were other pictures from 1980 that i had not seen one was taken on foster lane and showed a crowd watching an open army jeep pass by the soldiers had machine guns propped on their knees and one hand and one had beautiful hands with an index finger poised over so gracefully on the barrier. There was just enough light under his helmet for me to see his eyes, narrowed into slits. The driver was glancing at a nearly naked boy standing in water flowing down the gutter, his mouth open in a frozen, silent shock. There was a picture of a dead man who had been killed in Bramble's yard, trying to hide behind the refrigerator and the veranda. The man's eye was still open. Blood dribbled from his mouth onto a shiny polyester shirt with flowers. It was a playful pattern, something you would have found on Carnaby Street in the 60s. Absurdly, I started to cry. Don't weep for him, Bramble said. He was one wicked rascal, brother. But then he spoke gently, the way a Jamaican parent tell a child to stop sniffing. Stop your night. We sat listening to the night sounds on Foster, Foster Lane, the roosters and the dogs and the music from tiny radios. We are not here to say who is good and who is bad, Bramble said. You should only committed to reality. You should only be committed to reality. Rastafari, so you know say that the chapter is nice still in the no, I'm just not like when she writing a pattern. I don't think she should try writing a pattern, you know, you know, because the you know Jamaican people know how to read and understand English, and um the world does not understand, or can they get the emotions? from someone writing patwa, you understand? So I think it only defeats or uh, takes away from the energy of the story, you know, see? Anyway, I don't give the item thanks, you know, see? Mighty name of his imperial majesty, you don't know. Share, like, and subscribe. Hope you like that one, yeah? like I did. Rastafari.